All right, so had a website for 10 years. Learned a lot. Gonna go over it today so that you don't make the same mistakes and I can get your head. All right, your e-commerce website. Start from the beginning. 10, 20 years ago, cost a lot of money to build a website. Those costs have come down. Uh, I think for us, it was 20,000 uh, just for the basics. You can now set up a website and that bill took months. Um, you can now set a web, uh, well, I could set up a website live tomorrow for 70 quid. So you can see it's become a worthless uh, bit of technology. Uh, Shopify, for example, uh, that would be my go-to choice for uh, setting it up. You can literally be live tomorrow. So some things to consider. You go, you've decided you're going to go the uh, e-commerce and you're obviously going to set up a website. First thing, Shopify. Next thing, you've got your branding and your name. The most, um, I see a lot of people try to name the site the products, I think that's a really bad idea. You need to give the website a name unrelated because when you decide that this one product that you're selling, that you've called it dog food, dogfood.com, as soon as you want to sell cat food, your name's suddenly not relevant. And this will happen. I guarantee that your site, at some point, you'll want to branch out and not sell the, the thing you've put in that name. So think real careful. And also I'd make it something you can spell. When you tell, uh, I know a website's just launched, it's called Broody. How do you spell it? How would you spell Broody? So if you can't verbally spell it, if someone said the site is tent.com, you know how to spell it, right? If, if someone said Apple, Amazon, you know how to spell it. Pluto.com, perfect totally nondescript, it could do anything. Perfect name. So, branding. Everyone wants to get fancy. They then, you then have a nightmare because you need to be able to replicate your brand really easily. So I'd literally recommend your brand is the name in a specific readily available font that's free. That's your brand. Don't start drawing things with colors, with shapes that you can't replicate because it makes, it makes everything difficult. Either the initials or the name, that is your brand. Keep it so simple. Keep it literally the name of the website and keep the, the number of characters in your name as short as possible. There's many reasons for that. If you have a super long name, one, it's a super long name, but it, it then dictates the uh, shape of any branding you do thereafter. And it makes it really difficult. We had a very long name and it was forever a problem. I wished I had had like half the name size. Colors. Some websites have so many colors, it's like a rainbow. Try to stick to two main colors. Worst case, three. If you've gone past three colors, it's too many. Also, use, um, there's many online resources where you can check that your colors are compatible with each other. It's really important that when you're on a website, you're not being, your eyes aren't being offended. So uh, we used a color palette and found all the hex codes. So each color has a hex code um, and various other codes, RGB codes, hex codes and so on. Make sure you know your hex codes as you develop your brand. And I'd really just go with black or some kind of charcoal, um, really important. And also, well, be bold, make your website stand out. I, I'm a massive fan of um, like that fluorescent green, fluorescent orange, pink. It really stands out when people are searching around and keep it super simple. Next thing that steps on from colors, the font you use on your website, I recommend um, Google make their own font. It's called Open Sans, and they probably have others. It's a perfect font. Google made it. Google are your browser. Use their font. Um, websites, I think, make the critical mistake of trying to get you to sign up to the newsletter. Um, so they have pop-up. They then have a pop-up of a discount. 
They then have in the bottom right someone that's just checked out. You know that's rubbish. No one's just checked out. Um, and then in five seconds, another checker, another checker. It's absolutely rubbish. Ditch all that nonsense. No signups. Just you want them to get to checkout without having done a thing. So none of this sign up or uh, sign sign up sign up or um, what I call like um, customer data acquisition. Do that after checkout, never before. I'll say that again. Customer data acquisition you do after checkout, not before. Me personally, if someone's make, taking my data prior to checkout, I'm really going to leave the site. So may, remember, your e-commerce site is not for you, it's for the customer. The customer wants to check out in one click. On a product page, check out. And, you know, a bit like, I mean, Amazon's got it right. When did you last get a pop-up for Amazon? Never. When did you last have to enter your details into Amazon? Never. Can you do one click checkout? Yeah, you have to add the basket and then there's a checkout button. That's it. Two clicks. So strive for one. Before you set up your e-commerce website, what are your barriers to entry? If someone else can set up a website and now it costs nothing and sell the same product as you, don't bother. I'll say that again. If, so, if I could set up a website tomorrow for 70 quid and sell the same product as you, you need to stop immediately. You need a barrier to entry. You need to be selling you need to be the only one selling that product. So say you are the brand. So, I mean, I'm wearing a peak performance top. You can be the peak performance website. Yes, you cannot be a, another website that sells peak performance alongside another 30 retailers or uh, e-commerce. You cannot, you cannot be there. You will just get squeezed. You've got to consider your barrier to entry. If you're bringing in products from China or wherever they're being manufactured and they're your products, yes, you are good to go with an e-commerce store. If you've got no barriers, I really would think long and hard. That is basically why we stopped trading because all our products could be sold tomorrow by someone setting up a Shopify store for 70 quid. Warren Buffett talks about a moat. You need a moat. Just think about what that moat is. Now, let's say you tick all these, simple site, no sign up, one click checkout, great barrier to entry. Now you need volume. There's no point selling something, say in one territory, so say the, the UK or the US or wherever, and not, and, not think it, and not having the idea of scale behind you. You must hit scale. And that means you must have a back end that's capable <laughs> back end, of, uh, of working all those orders. So you need automation. You need, uh, so I, we made, I made so many mistakes. Our first website, we couldn't download the addresses for the orders. So I had to copy and paste each line of the address into UPS, the courier, to create a ticket that we then printed and then printed the invoice, put them together and that went to the warehouse. How nuts is that? What happened? What would have happened if I'd had a thousand orders a day? That would have been a thousand addresses, line by line, I'd, I'd need to have copied out. And this is because the, the people that built our website didn't build a back end. It, it was scandalous what we went through at the beginning and all the mistakes we went through. So, so before you sign up, it's so important that everything is a straight through process. A click to send all a thousand orders to the courier with no copy pasting of addresses. It's so important and that the tickets are spat out in a click. Once you're copy pasting, you've failed. 
Um, I still can't believe I want to cry the amount of hours I spent copy pasting addresses. And then it meant we had to build another website, one that could handle the volume and where I didn't have to copy paste addresses. And, and you'd think it's just fundamental to a, to a store and that the people building your store would think of this. It's just not the case. Um, even Shopify has its own issues in terms of reporting um, their the internal reports you get in the Shopify store are not good enough. You have to add on apps. The Sh Shopify framework is you get the e-commerce e framework from Shopify and then you have to buy other apps on a monthly subscription to fulfill certain needs. So for example, we used Shippy Pro to create the tickets, the, the tickets that have to be stuck on the boxes. Uh, if you're not into e-commerce, you'll wonder, well no, maybe you won't wonder, how does that box from Amazon get to your doorstep? Well, your order goes through to a pick team who go and find it, have to put it in a box, seal the box. Somewhere down the line, someone with a ticket has to know that that order goes with that ticket, gets stuck on, and then gets into an outbound tray somewhere to be picked up by a courier and make it to your address. So when you're not Amazon, a human being, believe it or not, has probably printed out your ticket onto a piece of paper and then also either copy pasted your address into their courier or they have an automated system that, that fed it in and that ticket came out and their hands touched that ticket, put it with that pick note and someone walked around a warehouse and packed that for you. Um, it, it's hard to consider that, that actually happens. So really important that you think of how will this scale? How, where is my stock? Who will pick it? Who will pack it? How can I minimize errors? How will that invoice stay with that ticket? How do you connect those? Do you do a page, the sticky pages, where you peel off the uh, courier label to stick on your parcel and then you include the remainder as the invoice? Or do you have a separate ticket with an invoice that you peel off and stick on the parcel? Really important things to consider. And you're not doing this for fun, right? So how is this all going to happen when you've got scale? Personally, I was a big fan of having my own warehouse so that you weren't paying margin away to pick packers because they don't, also don't care about your stock. They'll just write it off and you'll get losses and all this sort of thing. But think about the scale and how you're going to manage it. Because the idea is that you're not just picking 10 orders a day or 100. You want thousands of orders. Um, in terms of structure of the website, again, keep it super simple. Product pages. Um, we always wrote our own product descriptions. Uh, I saw sites that had no product description, just literally the name of the product and the price. And they seemed to get just as much traffic as we did. Uh, we hand wrote all product pages uh, with our own take of um, like how to describe the product. I don't think we saw any upside for that. So probably if I was to do it all again, I'd just have the name of the product. Um, blog pages, um, uh, reviews, all this kind of stuff. Did Does it add anything? Well, weirdly, the, the uh, blog posts in our website got by far the most traffic compared to product pages. So they can be useful, but again, it was really hit and miss. Some some um, blog posts got all the traffic and some blog, blog posts just got nothing. And, and they were just as good as each other. So you, you're, you're dicing with the Google algorithm. The Probably the most cost-effective way to be an e-commerce site is to not do any brand pages not write any product pages, this sounds scary, and just put all your resource into you or a, a technical expert managing, don't outsource this, your Google Ads. Because the, the just think of the Amazon site. Is there any blog posts? I've never read one. Is there any brand pages? I've never been to one. It's just product pages, and, and there's not, there's rarely ever any product description. You just check out, and there, there might be some, and you might kind of read it. 
But just think what they did. Everyone else doing these other e-commerce sites are doing blog posts, and brand pages and descriptions and all this nonsense, paying by the hour for all this content to be created. And it's all worthless. Um, Amazon's nailed it. Product page, check out, one click, straight through. Forget all the other nonsense. Concentrate on those Google ads. You need to be the one they're finding when they search for that product. I'll do another um, post about what I believed is effective e-commerce marketing. Uh, what I wanted to go through here was um, the basic considerations of your website and key thing, that barrier to entry. That's it. Forgot one last tip bit. I really, when I first set up the site, I really wanted to have a gamification of the checkout process. So when I'm, what I wanted to create, which I wasn't able to do, but maybe you're a coder and you can create this. I wanted to, as you hovered over things, stuff to happen as you're on the site. So for example, I wanted the green checkout button to shimmer. I wanted um, like, uh, if you hovered over the product, it to kind of automatically expand. Um, I wanted as you went through checkout, green ticks to appear give you that positive loop feedback. I think it's really important. I think sites have generally missed it. So I was always pressing on our developers to, as you type in your name, you get a green tick. As you type in your telephone number and address, tick, 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 positive loops. Um, sites just didn't bother. And I thought it was really important. Um, so gamification and that positive feedback loop uh, if you are good enough to do the coding, I think is really vital. That's my super tip.